So just some statistics to start off with. I think a lot of times people don't realize how um, relevant and people have in regards to TBIs. And it's actually one and a half times more deaths actually occur than AIDS. And you hear a lot about AIDS. You don't hear about TBI as much. And I think a lot of people do realize though that more than 50% of all motor vehicle crashes that involve a TBI, alcohol is involved. And I think what we're also seeing now is a lot more with the opioid overdoses that that is also becoming more prevalent in regards to um, motor vehicle crashes. And then each year we have about 230,000 people that are hospitalized with the TBI and actually survive. So that's a large number when you think about it. And if you think about our waivers here in the state and how many people are getting services under the acquired brain disorder waiver, you're like, wow, you know, that's a, that's a small piece of pie in regards to people who are actually surviving from a car crash. Transportation related um, injuries, that's very high for our 15 to 64 year olds, which is not uncommon. Um, falls is the leading cause for 65 and over. And I think falls, you have to understand falls are actually the leading cause of a brain injury nowadays. If you think about it, we're coming out of our icy season. So this is our slip and fall season. It's kind of stopping. Now we're getting into our mud season, so it's not as prevalent. But a lot of times when you think about our elders and in regards to falls, a lot of the falls actually happen um, more at night. Because if you think about any of us, we get up in the middle of the night, what do you do? You're half awake, you stumble over to the bathroom, you use the bathroom, you come back, you stumble back, and not a one of us probably turns on a light. And that's one of the most important things to do is to turn on a light, to make sure there isn't a tripping hazard in your way, on the way to the bathroom, coming on the way to the back. A lot of the elders will have small little dogs that are usually sleeping right there as they're getting out of bed and they're tripping over dogs or rugs or things like that. 11% of falls actually related to a TBI are fatal. So that's pretty high. And then fewer than one of 20 people with a TBI have received rehab that they need. And I think that's not uncommon either. That a lot of folks just kind of, as we say, they, they go home sicker and quicker. You don't hear of somebody staying in rehab for two, three months anymore. It's you're lucky if you're two weeks. You're in, you're out. Brain injury is actually the number one killer and disabler of um, children and teens and young adults in the state of New Hampshire, and I don't think people actually realize that. We have about 5,000 injuries that occur in our state each year, and about one in 10 people are actually affected in their lifetime from a brain injury. So if you think about that, you know, if we have 10 people out there, there's going to be at least one person who's been affected. You know, there's three of us sitting here. I'm at least one, and there's only three of us here that I've had a family member who's had a brain injury or a stroke. So it's very prevalent. When we take a look at stroke, it's actually the third leading cause of death in New Hampshire. I don't think people actually realize that statistic. It's, it's high. Um, and it's actually the number one cause of adult disability. So people don't think about stroke. And when people think about stroke, they think about stroke for elders. Oh, it must be somebody who's older. They must be in their 70s, their 80s, their 90s. No, young stroke, 15-year-olds, 13-year-olds, people in their early 20s now, especially now again with the opioid crisis and with all of the overdoses, a lot of times people are ending up having a stroke. And when people actually have those strokes, a lot of times when they go into the hospitals, that opioid diagnosis is a secondary or a third diagnosis. So a lot of times when we're taking a look at our stats, we're not able to really see that maybe the person had a stroke, but actually it was an overdose to begin with, which caused the stroke. So we have to kind of take a look at when we're looking at some of our data, understanding that, geez, you know, opioid overdose might be what really caused the issue. And so we need to take a look at that because you're talking about an addiction. And that's something that has to be worked on besides having the stroke or a brain injury. So I wanna take a look at some definitions and you'll see that we have um, two, we have one definition but a, a subset of a definition on top of it. So first off, we take a look at a traumatic brain injury or a TBI. These are those ones that we call, those are your typical, we say our typical kind of brain injuries. So your tra traumatic brain injuries are your car crashes, are your assaults, are your shaken babies, are your gunshot wounds, they're your falls, 
there's something that externally causes the injury. It's not something that actually is caused internally within an individual. So you have a traumatic brain injury. So then when you take a look at our second definition, acquired brain injury, an ABI, or acquired brain disorder, which is a, an ABD, and we have our ABD waiver, that's something that is not caused from something externally. A stroke is considered an ABD or an ABI. Neuroencephalopathy, overdoses, um, triple E, lead paint disease, brain cancer, brain bleeds, all of those things are actually considered an acquired brain disorder or acquired brain injury. A traumatic brain injury is also considered an acquired brain disorder or an acquired brain injury. It gets split out because a traumatic brain injury is seen as an injury that can actually be preventable. Now, when we talk about opioid overdose, of course, that is something that can be preventable too. But when you really take a look at it, traumatic brain injury is something, use of seatbelts, use of helmets, use of things like that. And also when you take a look at traumatic brain injuries or TBIs, um, a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are programs that only work specifically with individuals who have a traumatic brain injury. If you take a look at the polytrauma program at the Veterans um, Department, they specifically really work with individuals who have traumatic brain injuries. Individuals who have strokes have a harder time getting into that program because they're looking at TBIs. You look at some of the other state waivers, the Massachusetts state waiver only works with individuals who have traumatic brain injuries. TBIs. So that's how come you kind of split those two out. So an acquired brain disorder or acquired brain injury encompasses all of the brain injuries, including a traumatic brain injury, but a traumatic brain injury is specific to those external type of injuries. We call brain injury the silent epidemic. And if you think about it, anybody who knows anybody who's living with a brain injury or a stroke, they can look just like anybody else. You know, sometimes you just kind of go, the person might just be a little quirky, some people say, you know, and it's just because of their injury. So, and it can affect anybody, as you know. You know, some um, brain injuries also are not perceived as brain injuries. You know, people a lot of times don't want to say that they have a brain injury. Um, look at boxers, a lot of boxers. You know, Muhammad Ali, he never ever said he had a brain injury. He had Parkinson's-like syndrome. You really got to think and wonder about that. You got hit in the head many a times. So you probably had a brain injury more than likely. Okay. And it's actually largely unrecognized as a, a major public health problem. We hear about all of the other things. You think of, um, you know, if you take a look at some of the other diseases, you know, cancer has a lot of spokespeople for it. Um, behavioral health, you know, they have spokespeople for it. If you look at Parkinson's disease, first person you think of for Parkinson's disease, of course, is Michael J. Fox. He's right out there. When you think about brain injury, it's like, who do you think about? You don't think about anybody because nobody is in that forefront willing to take that step out. And then you really think back and you think about um, our Vice President Biden, who disclosed that he had had a stroke. So there is somebody who could actually kind of take that and run with that, but he just says, I had a stroke, it's not a big deal, and he goes on. So it's kind of interesting when you take a look at it. The other thing is too, is that a concussion is a form of brain injury. And I think that's coming more and more towards the forefront because of all the sports related concussions that are going on with the, um, you know, with the football players, hockey players um, in, in the state here, we're actually helping schools with pre and post testing. So any student who's going into any, to do any athletics with some of the high schools we have, they're tested, then if there's a suspicion of a brain injury, then they have to be post-tested. They can't go back into doing, you know, um, back into school and back into um, play until they hit their baseline again. So again, I already said it, who can get a brain injury? Anybody, any one of us can be walking down the street and get hit by a bus, It's just one of those things. So anybody can get a brain injury, but actually some people are a little bit more at high risk than others. Sorry guys, but men are twice as likely than females to get a brain injury. And if you really kind of think about it, you can kind of think about why that might be. If you think about guys, they're usually a little more of a risk taker. 
they'll actually kind of go out and do something. Whereas we women, a lot of times we'll sit back and maybe think about it before we do it. So it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the boy, he's on his bike. I'm going to go and I'm going to jump and go off that ramp. And the girl's probably going, hmm, I don't think that's a really good idea. So you kind of get that way of why the guys are a little more susceptible to a brain injury than the women. Older adults, again, I think we can figure that out. We kind of talked about that already. They're at a higher fall, fall risk. Um, and so that's an, that's an issue in being really careful. Our, our, you know, our ice is finally going away, we hope. We say it's gonna get warmer, we never know. We're still only in April. Um, so are we, we're not even in April, we're, we're in March, boy, I'm almost. Um, we're almost there. We're almost there, almost there. yeah. So older yeah. adults. And then anybody who actually has sustained a brain injury is more than likely to sustain another one, okay? And that includes concussions. And I think one of the uh, challenging parts when you talk about concussions is, is that when somebody has a concussion and they, ended up, and they end up with another concussion, they actually can accumulate. So a lot of times people that we'll see in our office, they'll say, I never really had a brain injury per se, but I had like five or six concussions. And because somebody hasn't really fully recovered from the first one, they get the next one and they just accumulate. So, changes after brain injury. So what I have going on for the next one is, is that this kind of can give you the next two slides can actually help you out if you're a family member, if you're a survivor, if you're a direct support worker, and you get your medical documentation and you start to read it. Everybody's very happy in regards to saying the individual had a left frontal lobe, you know, type thing. And you kind of go, well, that's nice, but what does that mean? So between this slide and the next slide, it can kind of give you an idea of what you might see if you read that somebody said that there's a right side injury to the brain. So when you take a look at this section right here, we have it broken out into a right side, a left side, and then the diffused injury. Now, traumatic brain injuries are mostly diffuse injuries. So you'll see things with issues on the left side, the left, right side, as well as the diffuse. The reason being is somebody might say, I hit my head. And it's like, okay, so you hit the front of your head. But as you know, your brain sits in the fluid and it's inside the skull. And so you have the hard surface with your brain just floating there. And if it goes forward, you know what happens. It's like if you have jello in a bowl and you move it, it goes forward and then it goes backwards and forward again and then backwards again. So if you shake it, even though it stops, it still keeps moving back and forth a little bit. So that's your coup, counter coup. So that, that's the reason why when you have some type of a traumatic brain injury, you're going to see more of those global issues. Now, if you have a brain bleed, cancer, or if you have a stroke, a lot of times you see that more specific. So it could be in a right side. So a lot of people know the right side affects the right side of the brain, controls the left side, and the left side of the brain controls the right side. So that's why if you see somebody who has a, a stroke on a specific side, they might have some paralysis, weakness, or some issues with the opposite side. So if you have a right side um, injury, You'll have that um, left side neglect, as well as you might see some impair impairments in visual spatial perception, decrease awareness of deficit. People don't realize that they can't do things that they used to do. The loss of that big picture. So a lot of times people will get very focused and they won't be able to see everything that's going around. Um, visual memory deficits, taking a look, you know, so people can't actually see something and then remember it. People after brain injuries might change the way they learn. They might be visual learners, you know, auditory learners, um, learners that need to do things. So um, those might be things that you see if you have a right side issue, okay? So if you have an injury on your left side, you might have difficulty in understanding language. So somebody's talking to you, so the words get jumbled and you're not fully understanding exactly what somebody's saying, okay? You might have problems actually expressing yourself. You know what you want to say, but you can't get it out. A lot of times people will say they have like word salad. It's all messed up in there. All the words are all mixed, messed up and trying to get out. And also it's a type of an aphasia. 
verbal memory deficits, decreased control of the right side, and we had talked about that. Sequencing can also be difficult. Um, so people might have a hard time following a recipe, so they don't do everything in the right order. Some very um, more severe sequencing that we have known about is, is that somebody actually has difficulty in regards to getting dressed. If you think about it, there really is a sequence to getting dressed. Your underwear goes on first before your pants or your skirt. And we've actually had people that would put their pants on and put their underwear on over their pants, not realizing that the sequencing wasn't correct. So you can have it as th that severe. And then we take a look at the diffuse injuries. You're gonna see the right side, the left side, but you'll also see the reduced thinking speed. So actually somebody, you might say to somebody, how are you today? And there's that silence because they are actually really processing and you can actually watch them process, okay? There might be an increase in confusion, a, reduce, a reduction in tension and um, concentration. Fatigue is a big one. I think if you think about fatigue, and, and we'll be talking a little bit more about it, but that's why a lot of times, you know, you might see somebody at 10 o'clock but they're already tired because they've gotten up and they've done a lot of different things throughout the day from nine to 10. And we can talk, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. And then um, impaired cognitive functioning across all areas, which we had talked about. All right. Now, when we take a look at the brain itself, okay, we're t we've, people always learn about the whole frontal lobe and the parietal lobes. So if you take a look at this, this will give you a general idea of also. So if you saw somebody who has a right frontal lobe, they might have issues with looking at the big picture and also organizing things on top of it. Because a frontal lobe can, do, can really mess up somebody's organizational skills. Problem solving, judgment. Your frontal lobes are always one of your more tricky things because those are your executive functionings. Those are your stop and think before you speak. You know, people that we will, you know, work with um, will just blurt things out. And that's because that frontal lobe, that stop, think before you speak thing, all taught as little kids, is no longer there. The filter is gone. And that can get into some interesting conversations, okay? Um, your temporal lobe, if you look at that, that does the memory the speech, hearing, understanding language, organizing, sequencing. That looks like it's kind of tucked up and kind of protected with the frontal lobe, when in reality it really isn't. It kind of sits underneath and there's actually a shelf that it, it sits on. And all shelves are smooth, except for in your skull. There's actually ridges on that shelf. So when that brain is going forwards and backwards, that core temporal lobe is getting scraped across an uneven surface. So that's why a lot of times when you see that people who have had, um, you know, a TBI, the memory, and that's because it hits there. Okay. Your cerebellum is now duck, uh, it's tucked in behind. Again, that coup, counter coup, that front, that back, that balance, that coordination. That's why you see that a lot. Okay. Your occipital lobe and then your parietal lobe, your sense of touch. All right, a lot of times, or not a lot of times, but what you can see is people who will put their hand right on a stove, a hot stove, and they don't even know that it's hot because that sense of touch is gone. And so that's why it's really important that people understand that so that when they see something red, they're not supposed to touch it. You know, our new stoves nowadays are wonderful because they get hot, you know, red, and then they're still hot, but they're not red anymore. So it's, it's one of those tricky ones. I had actually heard of a new stove that it's only hot when a pan is on it. If you take the pan off of it and you put your hand on it, it's not hot. And we're like, oh, wow, great. Those are going to be fantastic for our folks. Okay. And I think people, most people know about the brainstem, the breathing, the heart rate, and all of that, those types of things. That's what happens with that. So we're going to take a look at some possible side effects, okay, when you have a brain injury. Um, you know, speech, vision, hearing, some impairments for your physical effects, the balance, spasticity, those types of things. The less obvious, the headaches. Some people will actually wake up with a headache in the morning and have 
a headache straight through the whole day and the headache doesn't go away until they're able to go to sleep. Now, if you think about, you know, yourself or like myself, when I get a headache, I wake up, I have a headache. I take a couple of Advil's, ibuprofen. I take something, my headache goes away. I'm good to go. Think about if you had that headache all day long. Okay. If you you had that headache all day long, you might get a little testy when people were asking you things all the time. So just saying, taking that into consideration. And I want to get a little bit more into the whole fatigue thing of it. You know, we talk about fatigue and we're like, well, the person just got up. What can they be so tired about? Well, if you think about it, think about when you get up in the morning, and I want everybody to do this tomorrow morning. Think about it. You get up in the morning, think about every step it takes in regards to brushing your teeth. And people go, well, it's just brushing my teeth. Well, when you really start to think about it, well, the first thing is, is that you have to think about, well, where's my toothbrush kept? Where's my toothpaste kept? So you got to get them out. And I'll you know, talk to people and people say, well, then I put the toothpaste on my toothbrush. Well, no, you have to take the cap off. And do you wet your toothbrush first? Or do you wet it after you put it, the toothpaste on? Or do you do it before and after? And I know everybody's thinking about that right now. How do I brush my teeth in the morning? You know, do you put the cap on the toothpaste right after you put it on the toothbrush or do you do it when you're all done? So there are a lot of steps in just brushing your teeth. I wake up in the morning, I go through everything and I'm like, Woohoo, I got everything on. I'm good to go out the door. But think about everything you do in regards to that. Picking out your clothes in the morning, you know, taking your shower. Think of all the steps that you have to do in your shower, you know. Me, I'm in the shower. I'm usually thinking about what's going to happen in my day. And I just, you know, I wash my hair. I do the cream rinse. I wash my, you know, I get everything done. But if you think about all those steps, that's why people a lot of times are very fatigued. They have done more in their morning than we do all day long. And if you also think about it is when you've had one of those days at work and you just go home and you just sit there and you go, I can't think about another thing. And then somebody goes and puts a, you know, a demand on you and says, I need you to do this. The thing you're just sitting there going, oh, please, no. Sometimes that's what happens to our folks by the time we get to see them at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning. Okay. The other thing is, is a loss of smell. A lot of times people will lose the sense of smell. With the loss of smell, think about when you had a cold. If you can't smell half the time, you can't taste. And then the other half of the time, you're like, mm, I'm really not that hungry because when you go out and you visit someplace, or if you go into the mall, and the first thing you do when you walk by the Cinnabons, what happens? Your stomach growls because you smell those silly cinnamon buns, and they just smell fantastic. So if you lose that sense of smell, a lot of times the enjoyment of eating is gone because you just can't taste. It's like, eh, so I just have to do it, or some people just won't. Um, you can have issues with thinking. Memory, you know, learning new things, um, slowed thinking, we talked about that. Attention and concentration. Now, if you're working with somebody who actually um, may have had attention and concentration issues prior to their injury, you're probably gonna see it be even worse now. So any behavior that you saw prior to the injury is probably gonna be magnified in regards to after the injury. Very rarely does it go the other way. I have an individual that I work with who used to go for about three weeks without showering. Now he goes about two to three months without showering. So it's gotten worse instead of getting better. People can have rigid thinking, um, perseveration, difficulty with those problem solving, abstract thinking. Um, people can really get stuck, okay? And then again, the language difficulties. The executive functioning, that goal setting, Okay, problem solving, reasoning. And one of the things we're always talking about is we need to set goals, you know, and that's one of the hardest things for people to do is actually to set goals. Think about ourselves. A lot of times it's really hard for ourselves to set goals too, on top of it. Think about somebody who's actually having issues in regards to that. Um, learning from feedback, you know, um, the look, you know, those facial expressions of, Maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Or somebody who keeps doing the same thing over and over again, because you're not learning from feedback. And it's different when you're working with an individual who's had a brain injury because they don't remember. 
So that repetitiveness, a lot of times isn't going to work because they really and truly, they don't remember. Emotional self-control. Some individuals due to their um, brain injury, as well as people who are living with ALS, actually have no emotional self-control. They will just start to cry or laugh for absolutely no reason whatsoever. It just happens. Um, you just wait it out. You don't tell somebody it's okay because to them it's not okay. And it really isn't related to anything except for their injury. They have no control over it. And you just kind of wait it out. Worked with an individual who actually had uncontrollable laughter. And he started while we were in the middle of a meeting. So we were, his parents and I were trying to wait him out, but as you know, laughter is very contagious. So he's laughing. So the three of us started laughing on top of it. We all got through, he started to, you know, stop his laughing. So we were all able to come down and, you know, and he was very um, uncomfortable, embarrassed about doing that. I said to him, I haven't had a good belly laugh like that in a long time. But he says to me, you know, Aaron, he says, it's very hard when you're at your grandmother's funeral and it happens and it's like, oh, you know, so it's very hard for people. So, and then another executive functioning is organizing. A lot of times you'll go into somebody's um, apartment, their room, whatever, and everything is all over the place because it's just so overwhelming. Or as another individual said to me, she says, you know what? She says, I don't throw anything out because the minute it's gone, that's my memory and it's gone. And she says, I'll never remember that I even had it to begin with. So it's like, oh, okay, I get it. <coughs> Excuse me. So some people also will have some social skill issues, poor judgment, trouble understanding others' feelings, point of views. This is why a lot of times <coughs> divorce race um, rates are increased. Um, people will end up isolated, loss of friendships. When you take a look at looking at other people's feelings or actually points of view, if you're in a relationship um, with a significant other and you take a look at that and when you have some challenges and troubles, who's the person you go to? That's the person you go to. What happens when you go to that person and they really don't care about what's going on in your life because they only care about what's going on in their life. It really puts a stress on a relationship. So that can really be a hard time for people that are in relationships. I think the loss of friends is um, very prevalent also. I think some of the more challenging things is that when we're doing annual planning and family members would say, with the individual, I want a relationship or I want a friendship. And how do you make that a goal? You know, and the way you can make that a goal is by what do you like to do so we can put you in situations where you can meet somebody who's also interested in that. In isolation, I think, you know, a lot of times um, people can be in the middle of a crowd and be totally isolated. And we try our best to make people um, be out there and to be able to meet other individuals, but it can be very isolating and it can be part of that not understanding other people's feelings and being really into a me, I centered type of um, feeling. So Aaron, um, one question that I have is that, you know, with the, range, the wide range of um, potential consequences from a brain injury, I would imagine that there's a lot of variability in terms of how severe those impairments are or, or those challenges are. And I, I think I also wonder if there's, you know, um, there are times when somebody's challenges may start at sort of an imperceptible level, but then progress over time. I just wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think when we take a look at like the level of severity to an injury, mm -hmm. I think it comes down to how does it impact the individual in their daily life, in their ability to be able to participate in their community? Somebody can actually be diagnosed with a mild brain injury, okay? And it says, you read the documentation, well, this individual has a mild brain injury. 
But as the person gets back into their normal situation, that brain injury isn't mild. That is very severe because of the way it impacts them in the community, the way it impacts them in their life, in their work. So it, it's interesting when people say, well, it says that it's a mild brain injury or it's a severe brain injury or whatever. When you take a look at that, I take a look at that is, is that at that point in time, when that individual was looking at the survivor, that's what they saw. That's not really what you're going to see down the road. And you can also see people who were sit situated as, you know, a very severe brain injury and down the road, the impact isn't severe. So it kind of goes back and forth in that way. We can have personality changes, um, unreasonable anger range, the frustration tolerance level. We talked about the laughing and crying mm -hmm. spells, um, motivation, apathy, and um, lack of initiation. People really you know, have a lack of initiation in regards to after a brain injury. One of the things I try to remind people is, is that don't ask somebody if they wanna to go to the grocery store. Say, grab your coat, let's go to the grocery store. They can still say no, but they're more likely to actually grab their coat and go to the grocery store and get out instead of just sitting at home doing nothing. The anger and the rage um, and the aggression is um, very challenging to families and to family members, um, especially if somebody was a little, you know, had that issue prior to. Um, we've, um, we've worked with individuals where, um, you know, people are walking on eggshells all the time in the household just because of the individual who has a brain injury. Or they say, well, it's just easier to let them do that instead of, you know, trying to fight the battle because we just try to keep everything copacetic. So really and truly making sure that families get some good training in regards to how to support somebody and all of those types of things. But it can be very um, challenging. People are, can be very unaware of their deficits. Um, you know, somebody who has a seizure disorder, who's a roofer, really shouldn't go back to roofing. It's kind of, um, you know, a little unsafe. So really kind of trying to get people to take a look at what is, you know, reasonable and what is not reasonable in regards to those types of things. So unawareness is very prevalent. And unawareness can actually be on the side of the family. It's not always the survivor. We've had survivors call us and say, can you please talk to my family? They don't know why I can't go back to work because I look fine. You know, I'm a teacher. It's too much noise. It's too much changing set. I can't follow, you know, a lesson plan anymore because of what's going on in the classroom. But my family says, well, why aren't you back to work yet? So unawareness goes both ways. It's not just on the side of the individual who's um, living with a brain injury. You can have psychiatric disorders that actually come up from having a brain injury. Um, you also need to understand that if somebody had some type of a disorder prior to, that it probably is going to get worse, that they should actually have a med review. Because if you think about what psychiatric meds do, is actually changes the way the brain works and the way neurons fire. So if you've had a brain injury, a brain injury actually changes the way a brain works and the way the brain neurons fire. So if somebody's been on a medication for a long time and it seemed to work, there's a chance it might not work because of the way the brain is working now. I had a case in, for, for, um, you know, in point that I worked with a family member who his mother was um, bipolar and worked her whole life as a psych nurse with absolutely no problems. On her medication, had been on the medication for years, not an issue. She had a stroke and I said to him, you probably want her to have her reevaluated for her medications. And he says, no, 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 she's been on this medication forever, it'll be fine. Well, needless to say, um, she actually went back to one of her issues that she had prior to having her stroke and they did a reevaluation and they had to tweak her meds ever so slightly. So understanding that part of it. Um, drugs and alcohol really should not be done. 
your brain has already been compromised, you probably shouldn't do it. Um, people will, they will continue. Um, worked with a young individual who said, you know, I'm a cheap drunk now. It only takes two beers and to, instead of two six packs. I'm like, all right, well, you know, um, so it just should be something that you just shouldn't do. Um, different things to remember is that to remember that a, a person with a brain injury is a person first. So we always want to remember that. No two brain injuries are alike. If you've seen one brain injury, you've seen one brain injury. All right. Um, it, the effects are very complex and they vary greatly from person to person, kind of what Jonathan was asking about earlier. It, it's different for every single person. Um, the injury also depends on factors of your cause, your location, severity. Family support is very important in recovery process. Um, individuals who have stronger family support actually show that they have a better outcome in regards to their brain injury. Um, and the only consistent thing is remember that a brain injury is very inconsistent. It's not consistent at all. People like to like tie it up and put it in a nice little box. That's not going to happen, just so you know. It's going to be very inconsistent. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our services. So uh, just to go through, we actually um, provide quite a few services. These are going to be just a few of the ones that I'm going to talk about. So we have information and resources. We offer specialty case management services. We have transitional services veteran services, financial support, and we also do some school support services. So talking about information and resources, we don't do referrals. Um, we do resources to family members and to survivors and to professionals. Um, referrals mean to me and to us that we actually put our stamp of approval on it. And if you take a look at any type of a resource, um, I might like a therapist and I might think they're the best therapist in the world. And I give you that, say, here's a referral, you should go and see them and you can't stand them. So that's why we don't do referrals, we do resources. So we do have a toll free 800 number and it's um, located at the end of, on the very last slide. We do have support groups that are throughout the state. Here in Concord, it's actually held at Granite State Independent Living. Um, there are 14 groups. They um, are down in, all the way down in Nashua, over to the seacoast, over to Keene, all the way up to North Conway. We do trainings and workshops. We have a training um, program called Brain Matters that's available to um, individuals and to professionals. We do a hospital and rehab outreach. And with that, we actually work with transitioning people who are in hospital or rehabs back into the community. So we take a look at um, what their needs might be in the community. Do they need assistance of applying for different services? We can help them with that. We have our quarterly newsletter, and I'm sure a few people out there get that. We have our annual brain injury stroke um, and stroke conference that comes up in May. And then we have a resource directory. In our resource directory, we do have um, information specific to brain injury. But as you know, other resources go across disability. Housing goes across disability. Social security goes across disability. So all of that information is also in our resource directory. Under our specialty case management services, it kind of goes along a, a continuum of care type thing. So as you see at the very top, we have neuro resource facilitation. Our Neuro Resource Facilitation Program is available to individuals who are in the state of New Hampshire who have suffered a brain injury or stroke, and um, we help people navigate through the service system. You do not need to be on Medicaid to get this service. We can help individuals um, apply for Medicaid, Social Security, waiver services, um, housing, all of those types of things. Um, if somebody is on Medicaid, we're actually able to provide a little more service to them but the Neuro Resource Facilitation Program usually lasts about six months. It needs to be very goal-oriented. Um, so applying for Medicaid is very goal-oriented. You know, a lot of times we'll have people say, well, I'm trying to get a life. And, and, and getting a life isn't goal-oriented, so we back out and we ask people, what do you mean by that? Well, I want to get employed. Okay, so let's talk about that. 
So the neuro resource facilitation is free of charge. The next waiver is Choices for Independence or the CFI waiver. We provide case management services under the CFI waiver. So if you're receiving services under the neuro resource facilitation program, we can actually help you apply for CFI services. And if you receive CFI services, you can actually still continue to work with your same case manager that you were working with under neuro resource facilitation. So it's kind of a continuum. When people are under choices for independence, we actually take a look at them and we see if that waiver is actually gonna be sufficient enough for somebody. And if not, then we would do a referral over to the area agency services and have them apply for the acquired brain disorder waiver or the developmental disabilities waiver. Depending on when somebody's injury is, depends on which waiver you go under. But the nice part is, is both of those waivers you apply for at the area agency, so you don't have to worry too much about it. You just say, I need to apply for a waivered service and the intake coordinator will help you through that process, which makes it really nice. So because um, we provide um, case management services underneath the area agency community care waiver programs, because you do have a choice under those programs, you can receive your case management services from the area agency, or you can also receive them from the Brain Injury Association of New Hampshire. So we provide services under the Acquired Brain Disorder Waiver, as well as the Developmental Disabilities Waiver. There's also the In-Home Supports Waiver, which is also, again, underneath the area agency system. So it makes it very nice that those three waivers you call one place. Now, if you need to apply for Choices for Independence, that's not under the area agency waivered system. So there's two ways that you can do that. You can call our office and we can help you through that process, or you go to ServiceLink. And ServiceLink is where you apply for Choices for Independence. We also have a um, brain injury community support fund. I think some people have, um, a lot of people have actually applied for it. And there is some information in regards to the brain injury community support fund. We are the fiscal agent. The association is the fiscal agent for that fund. It actually comes down from the federal government. It goes to the state and then the state has asked us to be the fiscal agent. There are six individuals who are on the committee um, they are made up of um, area agency individuals, as well as individuals from the Brain Injury Association of New Hampshire. So for that funding, you need to be a resident of New Hampshire. You have to have medical documentation of your brain injury, and that medical documentation is actually pretty easy to get in the form, in the application. There's actually a um, letter that goes to your doctor where you just sign off, you send it to your doctor, they have a couple of questions they need to answer, and it gets faxed back to our office. So it's not like you have to go back and get all this documentation and all this information. You need to actually fall under the 522 regulations and eligibility, which is the, age, the acquired brain disorder waiver regulations, which is your injury has to happen after the age of 22 and prior to the age of 60. Now with that being said, because it is under the HEM 522s, this brain injury community support fund will also support individuals who are or who have a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis as well as Huntington's disease. So you need to remember that it's not just an ADD. It also includes MS and Huntington's disease. The next tricky part, as you can see, is that you cannot be eligible for the community care waiver, except if you are applying for dental. So any other thing, you need to go through your area agency. But if you need assistance with dental, you can apply for this funding. You needs to be a financial hardship. You need to have no other assets. The individual who applied for it one year and they had $30,000 sitting in their savings account, which was more than what we had for grant money, we said, we're sorry. You know, so one of those things. You also need to be at a modest level of income. And modest is, you know, people might, you know, say modest is, you know, $2,000. And other people might say, well, no, modest is $4,000 or $5,000. Modest comes down to what do you have coming in for your income and what do you have going out for your expenses, okay? We take a look at what's coming in and what's going out. It's not kind of like, as I say, not like Medicaid, where they only take a look at what you got coming in. They don't care if you have a roof over your head or meal or you know, food on your table. We take a look at that. We do care about that. So it'll take a look at that, that piece of it and we, we say, okay, yeah, they have, you know, they've got a big mortgage because, you know, people have mortgages, you know, they have these expenses, 
other types of expenses. So somebody might have five, six, you know, seven thousand dollars coming in, but that same amount of money is going out because of expenses. So we take a look at that. So don't worry too much about the whole modest level of income. All right. So it's considered a short-term financial crisis. It's not for ongoing bills. It's not for you know every month you're having a hard time paying your electric bill, or paying for your rent, or paying for your mortgage. If that seems to be the issue, we will actually hook somebody up with the Neuro Resource Facilitation Program, have them go out and take a look at everything that's going on. How come you're having a shortfall every single month? You know, what is going on? And try to help people in that way, okay? Um, it can be used for transitioning back into the, uh, into the community. People who may have been, um, you know, in a nursing facility and in transitioning back out, it might not have you know, um, a security deposit. You can go to the town for first and last month's rent. You can't go to the town for security deposits. So we can help with security deposits, things like that. And it's also to help, um, you know, safe and dignified living. Now, if we take a look at it in regards to all of those things, I, I'll tell you what it won't actually cover because that's a little bit easier. It won't cover the purchase of a car. And I say it won't cover the purchase of a car because the grant is up to $2,000. You're not gonna get a car that's gonna be dependable for $2,000. It won't pay for large appliances and it won't play, pay for education, okay? Because technically you should be able to get your education through um, voc rehab. So those are the things, three things that it will not pay for. We've helped a lot out with um, communication devices, um, iPads, laptops, things like that. When we take a look at that, we do request that um, speech and language or OT, some type of an evaluation come in with those um, to make sure the individual can actually use the device. One of the things we found out when iPads first came out was this is the next best thing since sliced bread. And we were buying iPads for everybody and they were going out the door like there was no tomorrow. And probably every 10 that went out the door, only one person was actually able to use it. So other family members ended up with really nice iPads. So we kind of stopped that practice and then making it a little more streamlined. Applications are long. I will give you that. We can help you in the office to fill them out. Um, applications are due the last Wednesday of the month. Um, they're reviewed the first Wednesday of the month. Determinations are made. Letters go out. We do not pay people directly. We pay providers. So things that we have actually paid for is we have actually helped with neuropsych evaluation um, costs because you get in that catch 22. You can't get on social security disability because you can't prove that you have a brain injury because you need a neuropsych test, but you don't have insurance. So you can't pay for the neuropsych test. So how do you get the neuropsych test? So we can actually help with those types of things. Driving evaluations, um, again, dental is a big one that we do. Um, we can help people get over the hump in regards to um, uh, if they're behind on rent we can help people with that. So different things like that. So that funding is available. So I just have, if there's any questions. Well, first of all, Aaron, thank you very much. I mean, that was a really great, um, I, I would, I was gonna say overview, but it was way more than overview. And I think you covered a, a lot of ground and, um, and certainly was so helpful to hear about the services that the Brain Injury Association is providing. One of the questions that I had, and, and maybe others have who are who are tuned in, is um, you know what is the sort of typical course of uh, recovery or treatment for people who who experience a traumatic brain injury or an acquired brain injury? I mean, is there a sort of, and maybe typical is the wrong word because you know everybody's a little bit different, right? What can somebody expect after a brain injury? Usually, what happens mm -hmm. is is that people um, end up with the you know they go to the acute hospital. Um, they go to an acute rehab, um, either they go home from the acute rehab or they go to a step down. Um, in the state of New Hampshire, we don't have a step down anymore. Our step down was Crotchet Mountain. So people are actually now having to go out of state, which is a challenge. Um, everybody, you're right, there's no typical type thing. Everybody goes at a different pace. I think what we see is, is that People um, actually get home, and that's when the challenges start, is 
people are very ex happy that somebody has lived through this trauma, whether it be, you know, a stroke, whether it be whatever. Um, and they feel that the person's going to come home and everything is going to go back to normal. And usually you see probably three months out is usually when things might slowly start to fall apart. And that's why we try to get in there earlier so that we can actually help people support through those transitions of going from, you know, one facility to the next facility out into the community and back home with maybe, maybe minimal services, maybe minimal supports. So the track is very different for different people. And the track is very different in regards to um, insurances. You know, you hate to say it, but it really is. So it really kind of weaves, bobs, and it's, it's so not typical. Mm -hmm. So we, a lot of times we're seeing people that are a little further out and you're trying to save something when you wish you were in there earlier because you would have been able to help them out with the stressors. I um, appreciate that. I, I think there's, um, again, sort of the, the message for our attendees and, and you know, the folks who are um, uh, downloading our recorded webinars, you know, there's, you know, like you said, when if you've seen one brain injury, you've seen one and the recovery pattern may be, you know, totally different with two different people and uh, mm -hmm. with a similar injury or similar condition. Um, but it sounds like there's certainly a great wealth of resources available with Brain Injury Association and other locations to, you know, for people to start the journey with. Um, how do people get more information about services or supports available? Well, actually, um, people, I just want to skip, do one more slide. And okay. Okay. Great. So <laughs> just, just, just for one quick thing, it's just, you know, just to remind people, it's only one particular millisecond yesterday that made the survivor the survivor and the caretaker the caretaker. So just to remember that piece of it. Um, for, more, for more information, our information, we do have our um, toll-free 800 number, which is 800-773-8400 or 225-8400. You can also email us at mail at bianh.org. And a lot of our information is available on our website at bianh.org. Um, our resource directory is available on our website, so people can actually go out there and take a look at that and, you know, get what they need. Great. Well, again, uh, I want to thank you, Aaron, for taking the time to um, provide this information. And to all of those of you who have signed in today and, um, you know, participated in the webinar, we're, we're grateful that you've uh, joined us, and we hope that this was a, a useful presentation for you. Um, again, we'll be sending out a link to a survey so you can provide us with any feedback uh, or ideas for future webinars, uh, and that'll be coming from um, Heather Young. The email will be hyoung at csni.org. Um, without any further ado, I think we're, we're just about out of time. So again, Aaron, thank you very much, um, and thank you to Heather Young, our Director of Education and Advocacy, for all her work coordinating uh, and promoting today's webinar and for following up with the uh, with the survey results. And lastly, thank all of you who have, who have joined us and we hope to see you next month. Um, our, our date for next month's webinar has not yet been set, but we are working on a panel discussion style webinar to talk about the interface between special needs trusts and the stable accounts. Um, so we're, we're, we're really grateful for our, our partners who are gonna be helping to present uh, on that. And please uh, be on the lookout for an e-blast or uh, Facebook post that will provide you with information on uh, the date for that. So again, thanks everybody for joining us and I uh, hope to see you next month.